wondrous love of God. Loved us while we were yet what? We were yet sinners. Uh, didn't just say he loved us. He proved that love by giving us his son Jesus Christ who died on the cross uh, for our sins. What great love. Hebrews chapter 8, if you would. We're going to just have one message from chapter 8. There's a key verse, verse number 6. And uh, we want to uh, take a look at Hebrews chapter 8, we're going to begin reading in verse number 6, that is our key verse, reading through verse uh, number 9. So if you have your Bibles open there, read aloud with me, and then let's begin reading in verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises." For if that first covenant had been faultless, 
then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Father, thank you for your word and for your great love. We uh, thank you, Lord, that you've established a covenant with your people, and uh, we thank you for the fact that that covenant is a better covenant based upon uh, better promises through Jesus Christ and his shed blood on the cross. And we love you. We thank you again for the privilege of looking into your word. Speak to our hearts today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Which is better, uh, the blueprint or the building? Now, I've seen some very uh, interesting blueprints. Uh, I've seen some designs that are very impressive. Uh, but can you live in those? And the obvious thing is the building is better uh, than the blueprint. Which is better, the copy uh, or the original? Uh, if I went over and copied a $100 bill in the office and I came over here and uh, I had the $100 bill in this hand and the copy in this hand, which one would you want? Which one is better? Uh, the $100 bill, right? Not the copy. Uh, which is better, a picture or the person? Now, if the person's a long ways away, then pictures are great. And we love to uh, look at those once in a while to remind us of somebody we love that's important to us. But if that person is right there and you're so enamored with a picture, you ignore them. Is that good? No, uh, the person is better than the picture. Uh, which is better, the shadow or the reality. So, you know, when you're outdoors in the daylight, there's a, a shadow that you cast, or maybe there's something that you admire, and it casts a shadow, but can you imagine somebody uh, just being enamored with that shadow and ignoring the real person or thing? Something new is better than old in most cases. Now, that's not 100% true, but for the most part. Not just because of the newness, but better in proficiency and quality. I remember my first car, and it was old, and I was talking with somebody about it the other day. Uh, I was just happy to have a car. I didn't care how old it was, didn't care what it looked like. Uh, you put gas in it, turn the key, it'd start most of the time, and you'd get around with it, and I was glad for that. Uh, but it was the best I could afford at the age of 16, but boy, as much as I liked that first car, I wouldn't trade what I have now for it. Uh, the same could be said about other products that we uh, buy and use. Uh, we have certainly seen advances in technology, and if you've had computers for some time, uh, you know obviously the one you have now is better uh, than the old one. Some of you remember those, some of those first computers that came out. They were literally cabinets. And then along came the desktops, and they were a lot smaller. They'd sit right on top of a desk, and they would have more power and speed and, and could have handle more data than those big cabinet models. And now we've progressed to laptops, and desktops have become obsolete, and there's iPads and iPods, whatever all of those things are, and even iPhones that function as a miniature computer. Think of the word covenant this morning. It appears frequently in Scripture, often preceded uh, by the words first, old, and new, and better. And uh, God made covenants with individuals as well as with nations defining the terms of the relationship He established with them. That's what a covenant is. Uh, this covenant is just uh, defining the terms of the relationship. Uh, it's not just a contract, it's a covenant, a relationship thing. It's important to understand the difference between a conditional covenant and an unconditional covenant. A conditional covenant is, if you will, then I will. But an unconditional covenant is, I will, regardless of what you do. 
the Bible basically is divided between the Old Covenant or Testament and the New Te Covenant or Testament. The Old Covenant was conditional and depended upon Israel's obedience to the law that God gave with it. The New Covenant is unconditional and depends only on believing in Jesus Christ. The writer of Hebrews has made references to people and things of the Old Testament or covenant that were pictures, shadows, or types of Christ and things of the New Testament or covenant. In each situation, the new is better than the old. Obviously, Jesus Christ is better and superior to any of the pictures, uh, shadows, uh, and types of the Old Testament that point uh, to him. Remember back in chapter 7, verse 22, by so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament or a better uh, covenant. The writer has already established the fact that Jesus Christ is better and superior to the angels uh, and to Moses and to the earthly high priest. And now in verse 6, Christ's better and more excellent ministry of salvation and intercession puts him in the position to minister the better covenant that is based upon better promises. The new is obviously better than the old and intentionally replaces the old. The old co uh, covenant was not only a copy but it also had its faults. Look at verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless. Now, does that mean that God's law was uh, unjust or imperfect and, and unrighteous? No. Uh, the fault was in the people with whom the covenant was made and not with the covenant itself. Look at verse number 8. For finding fault with who? With them. You see, the people couldn't keep the, the law. They, they couldn't measure up to it. God knew that when he gave it to them. Uh, God didn't give them the law thinking they were going to keep it. The inability to keep the covenant necessitated the need for a new one. In verses 8 through 12 of Hebrews 8, uh, the writer quotes from Jeremiah chapter 31 and verses 31 to 34, in which God foretold of the new covenant that would be superior to the old one. The rest of verse 8 says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Now it's always to the Jew first, and then uh, to the Greeks. So God's initial dealing was with Israel. Uh, they, laid, uh, him, they rejected him. He laid them aside. And now he deals with those who will put their faith uh, in him through Jesus Christ. Paul writes, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, con condemned sin in the flesh. That's Romans chapter 8. And verse 3. So there are at least five ways from our text today in which the new covenant or testament is better and superior to the old covenant or testament. Let me give you those five things this morning uh, as we look at chapter 8 of Hebrews. Number one, the person of the new is better than the pictures of the old. The writer now comes to the sum, he calls it, or main point of what he has already said and will continue to say. Verse number one, now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. He's not saying I'm going to uh, sum up everything here, but he said here, this is the main point. And what is the main point? He said, we have uh, such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Why would you leave this suitable and superior high priest and go back to a system of human and inferior priests. I mean, that's what these folks were tempted to do. 
Uh, they were thinking about abandoning uh, their testimony of faith in Christ and going back under that Judaism and, and that priestly system and that was far uh, inferior uh, to Jesus Christ. And so he's reiterating here in verse number one that our great high priest is in an exalted place. At the end of verse 1, he's on his throne, it says, in the heavens. And after his death, he's already said in chapter 4, verse 14, that Jesus Christ ascended into the heavens, where he was exalted by his Father. Paul writes in Philippians 2, verse 9, Wherefore God uh, also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. And so he's in an exalted place. And our great high priest has an exalted uh, position. It says in verse 1, he's at the right hand of the throne of the majesty. Jesus Christ is in the position of authority, uh, honor, and power in the presence of God the Father. Uh, this is the most exalted position in heaven and denotes the greatness of who Christ is and what he has done. Peter writes in 1 Peter 3, verse 22, who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. So he's in an exalted place and he has an exalted position and our great high priest has assumed an exalted posture. It says in verse 1 that he is set or he is seated. The writer emphasized this truth in the very beginning of his epistle. Look back in chapter 1 and uh, verse number 3 of Hebrews. Uh, he introduces this to, uh, this to us right in the beginning here. Verse 3, chapter 1, "...who being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, he what?" sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. By the way, he's still there. And no Levitical priest, no human priest sat down for his work was never finished. Uh, there was no furniture in the tabernacle or temple to even be sat upon uh, because there were always sacrifices for priests uh, to offer. Our great high priest, Jesus Christ, offered the ultimate sacrifice of himself, eliminating the need for any further or other sacrifices. And so the person of the new is better than the pictures of the old. Then secondly, the reality of the new is better than the shadows of the old. The writer is writing to Jewish believers who were familiar with the temple in Jerusalem and the priests were still offering gifts and sacrifices there at that time. Uh, they were saved out of that system but were now tempted to return to it. If Jesus Christ is a true high priest, then he must offer sacrifices in a sanctuary. And so the question is, is he offering sacrifices and where is his sanctuary. Jesus Christ, our great high priest, is a minister who is ministering in the sanctuary or true tabernacle. Verse 2, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. This is not an earthly tabernacle. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also uh, to offer. Now, the earthly sanctuary or the earthly tabernacle in which the priest and earthly priest ministered was merely a shadow of the real or true sanctuary or tabernacle in heaven. Verse 4, for if he were on earth... He should not be a priest. He's not from Levi, the Levitical priesthood, uh, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example, and here it is, shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, 
For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. And so this earthly tabernacle and priesthood system was merely a shadow uh, patterned after the true tabernacle or priesthood in heaven. The writer quotes from Exodus 25, 40 here to remind them that Moses received the blueprint for the earthly tabernacle from God, and it was merely a pattern of what was in heaven. The fact that Jesus Christ ministers in a heavenly sanctuary is important to the writer's uh, point. Look ahead to chapter 9 for a moment and verse number 24. And verse 24, chapter 9, for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are merely the figures of the truth. They're just shadows. But into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. The earthly tabernacle is but a shadow of the real tabernacle in heaven. The earthly priesthood is but a shadow of the real priesthood of Jesus Christ in heaven. The earthly worship is but a shadow of the real worship in the presence of God. They were all a shadow of the reality Jesus Christ would bring. And Paul writes in Colossians 2.17, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body or, uh, is of Christ or the reality or the realities embodied in Christ. The whole Levitical priesthood was but a shadow which anticipated uh, the reality, Jesus Christ, who was to come. The Old Testament priesthood was a shadow that pointed to Messiah, and now that he has come, there is no need for the Mosaic law or the Levitical priesthood. And the point the writer is making, why would you leave the real and return to the shadows. The new covenant that was prophesied in Jeremiah 31 found its official enactment with the death of Jesus Christ. The law required animal and green sacrifices, but no provision for human sacrifices that Christ offered. Jesus Christ offered himself as a one-time sacrifice for sin forever. In the night before his death on the cross, Jesus Christ told his disciples in that upper room, when he passed that cup, he said, this cup is the New Testament or covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. That's Luke twenty two twenty. Matthew's account says, Jesus said this, for this is my blood of the New Testament or covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. The benefits of the new covenant are for all who believe in Jesus Christ and his death for them, even the saints of the Old Testament. Look at chapter number 9 and verse number 15. Chapter 9, verse 15, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament or covenant, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. The benefits and blessings of the new covenant are for the individuals who are in Christ. When Jesus Christ returns in glory to redeem and restore Israel, they will benefit and be blessed by it. Jesus Christ is a living sacrifice in heaven, making all other sacrifices ineffective and unnecessary. Jesus Christ is our great high priest, interceding for us in heaven, making earthly priests unnecessary. Even after we are saved, we still need Jesus Christ to minister on our behalf. We can't even come into God's presence to thank him except in the name of of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the person of the new is better than the pictures of the old. The reality of the new is better than the shadows of the old. Number three, the relationship of the new is better than the ceremonialism of the old. The old covenant was designed to change people from the outside in. 
And that was through the law. However, the new covenant is designed to change you from the inside out. Look at verse number 10 uh, of chapter 8. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. And it's already a new covenant in place now. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Now, the law of the new covenant is engraved in the heart and minds of God's people and not on stone as the law of the old covenant. The law of the old covenant demanded that you follow a set of rules and conform yourself to the character of God, which was impossible to do. Under the grace of the new covenant, God inscribes his character in your heart and mind, and the Spirit of God who indwells you conforms you to his character. Sinful people need a new heart and new disposition within And that is exactly what the new covenant provides. The new covenant is about a personal relationship with God that supersedes all other relationships. The children uh, that were God's people in the Old Testament were called the children of Israel. They are still God's covenant people, but have been set aside because of their unbelief and rejection of their Messiah. Israel's relationship with Jehovah God will be restored through Christ when he returns in glory and establishes his earthly kingdom. Believers in Christ in the new covenant are called children of God. We're called co-heirs with Christ. We're called friends. Uh, We're called heirs of God. Uh, We're called sons of God. God's desire for each of his children is that you be conformed not to a set of rules, uh, but be conformed to the image of his son, Romans 8, 29. And as you yield yourself to the indwelling Holy Spirit, 2 Corinthians three eighteen says you're changed into the same image from glory to glory. The personal relationship and the inward transformation of the new covenant impacts how you worship. Worship is not just coming to a certain place at a certain time and occupying a seat and singing the songs and praying and listening to a sermon. You can do all of that still not be worshiping. Worship is with a focus on who we're worshiping, worshiping the Lord. And, and so this inward transformation will impact your worship. Worship in the old covenant was mostly ceremonial and external. You must learn that you can only worship God in the way that he deems uh, acceptable. People tell me, well, I have my own religion. I worship him my own way. And and I'm thinking in my heart and mind, there's only one way to worship God. And it's the way that he prescribes. And so this was the truth that Jesus Christ explained to the woman at the well whose focus in worship was on the place. She said that, you know, our people say worship here and you say worship over there. And, and she was all hung up on the place rather than the how. But Jesus said to her, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so the person of the news better than the pictures, uh, the reality of the news better than the shadows, the relationship of the news better than the ceremonialism, and then uh, number four, the clarity of the new is better than the obscurity of the old. The clarity of the new is better than the obscurity of the old. Under the old covenant, God's people depended upon spiritual leaders to help them know God and his instructions for their life. For the Jewish people, the rabbi was the expert who knew all, and the people ignorantly followed uh, what he told them to do. Uh, That's a sign of false religion when everybody depends on somebody to tell them how to know God and and what he wants them to do. And so some today still look to the experts, supposedly, whether priests or preachers, to tell them what they need to know about God 
and His ways. Uh, even some Christians act like they're under the old covenant and, and they cannot read and, uh, the Word of God and understand it for themselves. And this obscurity or supposed lack of knowledge is replaced with the clarity of the new covenant. Look at verse number 11 of chapter 8. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Your personal relationship with God and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit enables you to know God intimately and His ways clearly. Godly preachers and teachers can uh, help enhance your understanding of God and His ways. But under the old covenant, only the priests could approach God in the tabernacle and later the temple. In the new covenant, Every child of God and true Christian is a believer priest and can approach God and know Him on an intimate basis. Peter says in 1 Peter 2, verse 9 and 10, he says, You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. You and I do not need an earthly mediator or priest. There is no one who has better access to God than you if you're saved in a child of God. And then lastly, number five, the forgiveness of the new is better than the covering of of the old. Under the old covenant, sins were never forgotten. They are simply covered by the blood sacrifices of animals until a better sacrifice would come. Therefore, the priest offered sacrifices daily for the sins of the people, and then the high priest approached God in the Holy of Holies once a year uh, to make atonement for the people. The Old Testament sacrifices brought a remembrance of sins, but not the remission of sins. The Old Testament sacrifices were incapable of removing sin. Look at chapter 10 and verse number 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. And so there was no remission of sin under that. They were merely covered. The old covenant could not provide forgiveness to Israel, let alone to all mankind. It is only through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that forgiveness is possible to all who believe in Him and call upon Him. The benefit and blessing of the new covenant is the forgiveness of sins. Paul writes in Ephesians 1:7, "...in whom Christ we have redemption through His blood." The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. 1 John 1, 7, it's the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, that cleanseth us from all sin. The basis of the new covenant is the blood of Christ. And we can sing, with, as did the hymn writer, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. In Christ, God totally forgives you, cleanses you, and remembers your sins no more. Look at verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Is there something wrong with God's memory? No, not at all. What that phrase Remember no more means, it said, I'll hold it against you no more. Unlike some humans who never let you forget your past, God knows what you have done, but chooses not to hold it against you and remind you of it. God deals with you in grace and mercy rather than law and merit. God can do that because where did he place your sins and my sins? They were all put on Jesus Christ on the cross. You cannot erase the memory of your sins, but you can forgive yourself because God 
has forgiven you. You can rejoice in what God has done with your sins. It says he has removed him as far as east is from the west. Psalm 103, 12. He has cast your sins behind his back. Isaiah 38, 17. No matter where you turn, you can't see what's back there unless there's a mirror there. He has cast your sins into the depths of the sea. Micah 7, 19. There's nobody ever been there. 1 John 1, 7 and 9. He's cleansed you and wiped the slate clean. The word translate cleanse or cleanseth means to purge or purify. How many of you had an etch a sketch when you were growing up as a child? All right. Yeah, I remember those things. Remember that? Man, you could draw on that thing and you could write on that thing and then you'd turn it upside down and shake it. And when you turned it back up, what happened? And it was all gone. There was no trace of that drawing or writing. And folks, God has a divine etch a sketch when it comes to your sins. And one of your great privileges as a child of God is that the forgiveness and cleansing of your sins is just a prayer away. The new covenant was given because the old covenant had grown old and had become obsolete. Final verse, look at verse 13. In that he saith, a new covenant, he hath made the first old, now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. The old covenant was not bad. It had simply served its purpose. It revealed the sinfulness of man and the need for a Savior. It foreshadowed and pointed to the Savior, Jesus Christ. But now the Savior has come and there's no more need uh, for the shadow. And since its destruction by the Roman general Titus in 70 A.D., the temple in Jerusalem has not been rebuilt and sacrifices have not been made. Really, the old sacrificial system ended when the once and for all sacrifice of Christ was made on the cross and the veil of the temple was rent in two, Matthew 27. Which covenant are you operating under? Still trying to operate under the old covenant? Still trying to approach God on the terms of that old covenant by trying to work for your salvation or trying to earn God's approval uh, and forgiveness? And that effort is doomed to fail and will leave you under the guilt of your past and sin. And God's desire is that you approach Him today on terms of the new covenant by simply acknowledging to Him that you're a sinner and by believing that Jesus Christ is the Savior who died on the cross for your sin and by calling upon Him and inviting Him into your heart and life to be your Lord and Savior. And if you'll do that on the basis of that new covenant, He will not turn you away, but He will save you. He will forgive you of your sin. He will cleanse you of all your sins and you will receive eternal life and become a child of God. Boy, what a better covenant. Is so much better than the old. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you again for your word. And a lot of this, perhaps uh, to some, they would just pass over it, not even read it. And yet really this is the, the meat of the word. And to think about how you related to your people in the Old Testament or covenant. And how you relate to us today. And boy, the relationship and intimacy that we can have with you that was not there under the old covenant. Thankful, Lord, that we're not under the law today because none of us can keep it. We're thankful that our relationship to you is all dependent upon the blood of Jesus Christ and our faith and trust in him. Lord, if there's one here without Christ today, may they trust in him for salvation. If there's any of us that are saved and we're still trying to go back under some of that old covenant thing and live by a whole set of rules and do's and don'ts and things of that nature, we know that's not nearly as good as the new covenant where your law is written in our hearts and minds and we don't obey because somebody tells us to. We don't obey because of some rule, but we obey because we love you and you have shown us that we're to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand for say verse 2 of invitation. God speaks to your heart, you come.